Hi, so nice to meet you. I'm Jess Camille, and I'm a graduate student researcher in Harvard's Department of Earth and Planetary Science. I study the atmospheres of Earth-like planets, both in our solar system and in other solar systems, to try to understand what the atmosphere can tell us about how a planet's climate is able to evolve over time. Today, I want to share with you a little bit about my favorite planet, Venus and explore what it could tell us about life on our own planet and potentially life elsewhere. So there were once these twins that were separated at birth. They were fraternal twins and they did not grow up in the same home. So they weren't exactly alike, but they were genetically very similar. But they did grow up to be very different and it wasn't until they got much older that they learned about one another and realized just how different they were. One twin was very positive and encouraging and supportive, while the other had a very different personality, very independent and edgy. But it's kind of weird how they can become so different when they started out so similar, right? Well, as it turns out, these weren't human twins, they were twin planets. Venus, the second planet from the sun, so closer to the sun than Earth is, is often referred to as Earth's twin. It's about 95% the width of Earth and about 80% of Earth's mass, to be precise. So it's only slightly smaller than Earth. And it has an atmosphere with very dense clouds, just like Earth, and they have very close chemical compositions. In fact, we know that they were born at the same time in the same cloud of gas and dust about 4.6 billion years ago. So they were literally made from the same stuff. It's because of these similarities that we once thought that below its super dense clouds that Venus could be just like Earth and could maybe even be home to life. But it turns out that under those clouds, Venus looks a little bit different than Earth. So let's start by reviewing what it is that we do know about Venus. So pictured here are the first four planets from the Sun, the second of which is our friend Venus. It is 110 million kilometers from the Sun. So that's about two-thirds the distance of the Earth from the Sun. So it does make sense that Venus is warmer than Earth, since it is closer to the Sun. But get this, even Mercury, the closest planet to the Sun, is cooler than Venus. That's a little crazy, right? So Venus is hot, like really hot. Like 900 degrees Fahrenheit hot. And its atmosphere is made almost entirely of carbon dioxide which is so heavy that Venus has an atmospheric pressure almost 90 times that of Earth. That's like bone-crushing pressure. It even rains sulfuric acid on Venus, although it is so hot that the sulfuric acid evaporates before it ever reaches the surface. Now, does that sound like some place that you would want to live? Me neither. But why is it that when they started out so similarly, Venus is so different from Earth today? So scientists speculate that Venus may have, a very, very long time ago, had liquid water oceans and could have been far more temperate, far more comparable to present-day Earth conditions, really. But it turns out as the sun gets older, it also gets hotter. And at one point, Venus's clouds started to trap more heat than they reflected back into space. And at this point, all of that trapped heat began to evaporate the oceans. In this animation, you can see how the incoming heat from the sun towards a planet can be illustrated as two streams. One larger stream that is absorbed by the planet and one smaller stream that is reflected back to space. On the right side of this animation, you can see how the heat cycles through the atmosphere. As it's released from the Earth, most returns back into the ground. Some will be absorbed by the surrounding atmosphere and some will be radiated back to space. And how heat is able to circulate through the atmosphere is largely regulated by the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is where certain gases, which we call greenhouse gases, trap a specific wavelength of light that we call infrared radiation. And they keep that infrared radiation from escaping to space, which further heats the atmosphere. Now it turns out that water is one of the best greenhouse gases. So when Venus's oceans evaporated, it further warmed the already very hot atmosphere. But wait! there's more. Carbon dioxide is also a very strong greenhouse gas. And any carbon dioxide that was dissolved in the water and even in the mantle of Venus was then released into the atmosphere, even further heating the planet and making the atmosphere even thicker. This whole process is known as the runaway greenhouse effect because the heating of the atmosphere causes more greenhouse gases to be released to the atmosphere, 
which further heats it, and it's a cycle that continues. But one really interesting question is, how is that carbon dioxide able to escape from the mantle? Why does material move between the mantle and the atmosphere of a planet at all? Well, have you ever poured yourself a glass of soda and you set it on the counter only to forget about it for a little bit, but by the time you come back to it later, it's gone flat, like it's not busy anymore? That's because the ability of the carbon dioxide bubbles to stay dissolved in the soda, known as its solubility, is dependent on temperature. The warmer it is, the less soluble the carbon dioxide will be, and it will be pushed out of the soda into the air, which is why your soda doesn't stay fizzy and fun if it's not kept cold. The same thing happens with carbon dioxide in the magma of a planet. As the planet gets warmer, the carbon dioxide that's dissolved in the liquid magma will be released into the atmosphere. And like we talked about carbon dioxide being a fantastic greenhouse gas, putting it in the atmosphere will trap even more heat, which will warm the planet, which will then decrease the solubility of the material in the magma. And so that cycle continues. So we're curious about this process of material moving from the mantle to the atmosphere and how that affects the climate that a planet is able to have. But how exactly can we test a hypothesis like this? How can we explore different questions and make predictions? It's not like we have a planet that we can run experiments on. Since we can't just go into a lab and make a Venus and play around with it, we can use a computer to make a so-called virtual Venus, or at least parts of it. I make models of Venus using a programming language called Python, where I use math equations to represent the physical phenomena that we know is occurring on Venus. And I can vary the conditions and inputs to see how things behave and evolve with time. Here on the left is my Python script, and here on the right are the numbers that my code produces and the graphs that my code produces. So most of the results of this kind of work are in the form of numerical data and graphs, both of which I can try to find patterns in to better understand what physical stuff is actually happening on Venus. So from the results of these models, what do our results tell us about a planet's climate and how it's able to evolve? The results of my research tell me that this runaway greenhouse effect that we learned about, dependent on this exchange of any materials between the mantle of the planet and its atmosphere while it cools, is the largest contributor to why Venus is so drastically different from Earth today. Specifically, Venus started out with just a slightly larger supply of carbon dioxide than Earth and was just slightly closer to the sun, meaning that that additional heating from being closer to the sun resulted in a runaway greenhouse atmosphere that was essentially inevitable. So now for the fun question, could there be life on Venus? Well, from what we learned today, we know that Venus is ridiculously hostile, so there's no chance of any human life being able to survive those conditions. I mean, we can barely get probes on the planet's surface before they start to melt. But this does not mean that there wasn't the potential for life at some point. There are several new missions that have been announced recently that will focus on exploring Venus and its potential to support life at some time in its past that will probably be launched over the next five to ten years. These kinds of missions will help us understand many things, like how life came to be on Earth, what Earth might look like under very dramatic, drastic conditions, and also what we're looking for as far as signs of life on other planets in the future. So it seems like a pretty worthwhile endeavor if you ask me. Thank you so much for being a scientist alongside me today as we investigated Venus versus Earth and learned a little bit more about why our solar system came to be the way it is.